Okay, so this should now be live. Let's see. We ask people. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, okay, so now I'll just mention this in the Discord. Okay. Cool. So we've got a few people here. Um, maybe we can um, uh, give a few minutes before we actually start the the presentation. Um, but uh, you know, while we're getting started, maybe um, Moshe and Aaron, would you like to introduce yourselves? Okay, I'm Oren, uh, part of the. Uh... Setfit uh, project, working at Interlabs, uh, NLP team. Uh, go ahead, Moshe. Yeah, uh, Moshe Pastablat. I'm uh, leading the NLP team at uh, Interlab as part of this project. Uh, looking forward and exciting. Great, thank you. And uh, for everyone else, I'm Lewis from Hugging Face. I um, work primarily on the open source team, and i am also been very excited to be working with Moshe Luke, Oren, and others on uh, making uh, few shot learning actually work in the real world. Cool. So we've got a few people. Um, we're just tuning in. Um, what do you reckon? Shall we just start, and then people, I think, can later, um, uh, you know, watch the YouTube recording. What do you guys reckon? Shall we start Swiss style? We start on time. Cool. So. This, um, this talk or this presentation today um, is primarily about um, how to do few shot learning um, efficiently um, using a special type of transformer model called uh, sentence transformers. And this is work uh, done together with uh, Intel Labs and uh, UKP in Germany. Um, and it's basically broken down into sort of three things you can check out after this talk. We have a paper which goes into a lot of the sort of nitty gritty details on how this technique works and shows lots of different experiments we ran um, to compare against other methods. Um, but if you want just a high level summary, you can um, check out the, the blog post, which uh, gives a more conceptual understanding of what happens under the hood. And finally, if you want to actually use um, the methods that we discussed today, um, we have a, a library um, called setfit um, on GitHub that you can uh, pip install and run uh, in Colab. So let's get started. And can I switch my thing? Okay, so what we'll do today is um, we'll start by talking a little bit about, you know, what, what is future learning, uh, why is it important, and how does the set fit method work? And then we'll dive into uh, a bit of a hands-on demo uh, with the set fit library to sort of show you how it works in action. And finally, we'll leave some time for a question and answering uh, session. And if you have any questions um, during the talk, um, please feel free to put them in the YouTube chat and we'll take um, you know, the questions as they come so that it doesn't just uh, you know, become me speaking into a, into a screen the whole time. So with that out of the way, let's uh, start by talking a little bit about few-shot learning and uh, few-shot learning in particular with language models. So I think this is a fairly kind of old, uh, let's say, idea. Um, it's, it's not just been around the last few years, but um, in some sense, I think it was the arrival of GPT-3 by OpenAI um, that really popularized um, this idea of, of what future learning uh, entails. And in their paper uh, with GPT-3, um, they described future learning um, as basically a way of describing in natural language um, some task 
um, providing a few examples of what that task looks like, and then finally uh, getting the model to basically autocomplete um, the, the prediction uh, from that prompt. And so you can see here um, in this example, um, if you start by specifying the task as a translation task, so you say translate English to French, and then you give some examples like sea otter, and that's luteur de mer, and peppermint is meant to pouvoir. Then the idea is that if you provide enough of these examples, at the end, when you translate cheese, you hopefully get the, the correct French translation. And this particular type of um, uh, few shot learning, it's called few shot because you're only providing a few examples. Um, but it specifically, it's called in context learning um, because in the case of um, GPT-3, there are no gradient updates uh, performed on the model. So this is really just uh, an inference time uh, sort of form of prediction. And what they showed in the paper is that um, if you look at the performance um, of uh, across many different types of NLP tasks uh, with GPT-3, um, as you increase the size of the model, you start to see um, rather big gains in the future uh, regime. So you can see in this uh, plot on the right that when you're dealing with like, you know, a few hundred million parameters, your kind of average accuracy across many different tasks is like 30%. But then as you scale this up to 175 billion parameter model, you're now looking at an average uh, score of, you know, a bit closer to 60. So that's a fairly non-trivial gain. Um, but of course that gain isn't for free. So the, the kind of two main um, problems or challenges with this uh, in-context learning is that first of all, you need to come up with a good task description and some good examples um, that the, the model is able to use um, appropriately. And this often leads to problems where the performance of the model depends on the choice of prompt. So if you're on Twitter, you may see every now and then people coming up with very clever prompts. For example, it's recently been shown that if you want GPT-3 um, to do high order reasoning about say science problems, if you just add the prompt, let's think this step by step, it will then iteratively you know, generate a, a much better solution. And so this kind of sensitivity to the type of prompt is, is a bit of a, a challenge. And of course, the other like more practical challenge is trying to actually deploy 175 billion parameter model isn't really a super easy task. And in general, it's basically prohibitive if you want to actually, you know, use these techniques on edge devices or any sort of, you know, smaller hardware. So although this is uh, definitely a very interesting phenomenon and very promising, it has these kind of two limitations. So of course, uh, many researchers have uh, worked on trying to, you know, reduce the size of the models and to, to make this idea more efficient. And one of the like, most popular ones uh, in recent years is something called uh, Pattern Exploiting Training, um, or PET, and uh, a more recent variation called Adapet, uh, which makes it uh, you know, a little bit uh, easier to train. And the basic idea of these uh, Pattern Exploiting Training methods is that instead of doing everything with um, a kind of in-context prompt, like in GPT-3, what if we could convert the um, thing that we're interested in classifying, for example, best pizza ever, into a format that was more similar to the language modeling task of the underlying model? So if we think about models like BERT and all the sort of masked language modeling, um, masked language models um, that we have, one way we could think about this is that we just take our input and then we just append um, a little uh, piece of text where we try to get the model to fill in the blank. So you can say here, um, if we give best pizza ever, then if we just append something like it was blank, then the mass language model uh, presumably will have a pretty good chance of filling in that the most likely token for that is great. And then if we have that, we can then define a mapping which converts uh, you know, the positive or negative labels to the um, you know, vocabulary that's present in the, in the language model. So you can see in this kind of example here, end to end, we provide a piece of text. We get the language model to fill in uh, some template. And then based on that output, we try to assign uh, a score. And this, um, this method works uh, quite well. Um, you can see in this plot here um, with Adapet, which is an improved version of PET, um, that they're able to actually surpass the performance of GPT-3 um, on the SuperGlue benchmark. Um, and also using, um, you know, a very small fraction of task-specific data. So 
one of the challenges in the original um, PET proposal was that you had to provide a lot of uh, specific training data um, of a given task, you know, framing things in terms of, let's say, text classification. And Adapet was able to kind of do away with that and actually do uh, get quite good performance. But you can see that we have a similar kind of problem that we mentioned with uh, GPT-3. So here, you, instead of having to create um, task descriptions and uh, explicit examples, you have to craft a prompt template. So we have to come up with lots of these different ideas of how do we append things for the language model to, to fill in. And the other challenge is that um, because the we need a way of mapping um, the labels to the vocabulary of the language model, um, these things are called verbalizers and they tend to have kind of variable lengths of how we do that. And this means that it's typically very slow to train. We can't typically train these models using batching. And a lot of the kind of implementations like Adapet and PET typically use batch size one, which makes it quite slow to train if you're using something like, you know, an Albert or a Roberta large model as your backbone. So although the performance is good, we do have this kind of intrinsic dependency um, on these intrinsic limitations. So the most recent um, attempt to, to make things more efficient and um, a bit less, uh, well, a bit faster to train and so on, um, is something called uh, parameter efficient fine tuning. And uh, this is an idea which actually goes back a few years um, to this idea that instead of having to retrain or fine tune all of the parameters in a language model, what if we could find a way to insert some special layers which are conventionally called adapter layers um, into the network itself. And then we essentially just train um, the, the weights of those adapter layers while leaving the vast majority of the network untouched. And this idea of using adapters, it's basically just injecting a, a couple of feed forward networks um, inside your transformer uh, layers. Um, and this has been used um, in, in a wide range of applications from things like uh, multilingual uh, transfer, if you want to convert a model that has been, say, trained in English, uh, German translation, and you want to extend it to French, you can try to use these adapters to, to improve the generalization to new languages. Um, but more recently, um, a research team with Colin Raphael and others um, in the US, they proposed something called TFU. And what TFU does is it basically combines this idea of using adapter layers and a kind of efficient training regime for them together with um, a, a multitask model called T0, which is uh, something that um, was trained as part of the Big Science Project. And the idea here is that this T0 model is a language model very similar to GPT-3, but it's been trained on many different tasks in parallel. And so the idea here is that if we can find ways to efficiently update um, certain layers or these adapter layers inside T0, then we might be able to do few shot learning across many different tasks. And so what they show here in their paper is that um, TFU um, is not only more performant than GPT-3, um, it's also far more efficient. So this plot is showing essentially the, the average accuracy across a, a range of different data sets they, they benchmarked. And on the x-axis, you have the, the flops um, per example. So this is basically showing that um, for inference, TFU is around one and a half to two orders of magnitude uh, more efficient than GPT-3. So this is a, a great step forward um, in having both high quality models, um, but also the ones that are faster to, to train and run. But again, because it depends in this particular case on T0, which has this kind of language modeling component, um, you do have to do a fair amount of prompt engineering. And when we ran our own experiments in the SetFit uh, paper, we also found that we had to spend a fair amount of time coming up with clever prompts to adapt this type of approach to new data sets. And that's kind of a bit too close to, you know, labeling your own data. And it feels a little bit like, you know, we're, we're not quite solving future learning uh, in a kind of, you know, generic way. And the other thing is that the performance of this model tends to also depend on um, having a, a sort of large sort of 10 billion parameter model. And just for context, this is around, you know, 12 gigabytes or 11 gigabytes uh, in your disk space. So if you wanted to ever deploy such a thing on, you know, a phone or whatever, um, it's going to be quite a struggle uh, to make this work. So although a, a great step forward, still um, we have some limitations here. So the main thing that um, I think Moshe probably was the first one to ask himself is, you know, can we do better um, than, 
you know, depending on prompts, depending on large models, and depending on a lot of this kind of like feature engineering uh, approach to, to future learning. And the, the answer is uh, yes, we can do that. Um, and there's a proposal that we have in our paper called SETFIT, which stands for Sentence Transformer Fine Tuning. And this uh, idea is remarkably simple. Uh, it basically breaks down, um, say, something like text classification into a two-stage training recipe. And the first stage involves first adapting um, a pre-trained sentence transformer um, to learn um, how to handle uh, essentially this new set of uh, small labeled examples. And we'll see more details of that in a second, but basically this relies on using contrastive learning um, to learn rich representations of the labeled data. And then once we've adapted that sentence transformer, we can then use the embeddings from it essentially as features to a classification head, which then we can just train um, in a standard fashion. So in, in the paper, we just use something very simple, just logistic regression. But in principle, this could be just a, a neural layer um, with some classes. So this is essentially the, the, the idea. And um, we've uh, shown in the paper that it works quite well for text classification um, and other ideas in, for example, token classification we're currently investigating. So just keep in mind that what I'm telling you today is mainly about text classification. Um, but you know, maybe in the not too distant future, we'll have uh, a similar approach for other tasks. And if you have any questions, just uh, please put them in the YouTube and I'll, I'll, um, I'll answer them whenever they arise. Okay, so let's uh, dive in a little bit to how these two stages of training work in more detail. So I mentioned that we use uh, contrastive learning um, to adapt the sentence transformer. And it's probably better to explain, you know, what is contrastive learning using computer vision uh, because it's a little bit more intuitive. So the basic idea of contrastive learning is um, you want to kind of adapt your neural network so that the resulting embeddings um, are basically pushed into regions of the feature space where um, sort of images or inputs that are similar are clustered together and images that are different from each other are pushed away from each other. And so you can see in this example here with a, a dog, um, we start off with a, an image of a, a golden retriever. This is typically called an anchor in, in the jargon, but that's not so important. And the idea is that, okay, um, this, this might be have the class dog, and this other image here of an owl is, is obviously a different owl. So we might have two classes, dog and owl. And what we do is we um, basically encode all of these images together, and then we measure um, the distance between the embedding of dog with a kind of dis an augmented version of itself, and also the distance of dog compared to the owl. And so if we can kind of develop a loss function that will progressively minimize the distance of similar dog images and push or maximize the distance of dog to every other type of image, this will help us um, construct a, an embedding space um, where constructing a decision boundary on this for classification um, is much, much simpler than you know, just starting from scratch. So what you can see on the right hand side here is an example of, of what this looks like in the feature space. So here, um, this theta is, is the, the network. And so if we pass, for example, echidna, we end up at some place in this, in this feature space. But you can see that, for example, raccoon, um, these two raccoon images are kind of closer to each other. And as we train, we expect that we will basically push these raccoon embeddings closer and the echidna ones will go further away. And I see that there are a few questions in the chat, so maybe we'll take them now. The first one is from Yang. What if the pre-trained model is not optimized by contrastive learning? Any effect on that? So that's actually um, a, good, a great question. Um, one thing that we looked at in the paper, um, well, I don't know if we put it published in the paper, but it's definitely some experiments we did, was comparing the effect of using sentence transformer models, which are in some sense well-suited for this contrastive learning process versus standard transformer backbones. So things like, you know, BERT, distilled BERT. And I think Aaron or Moshe can correct me, but I think from memory, this tended to be much better when we use sentence transformer uh, backbones. So, so there is an effect depending on the, the pre-trained model you choose, um, but our advice would be to, to pick a sentence transformer. 
I don't know if anyone, if Moshi or Aaron want to comment on that. If not, I'll go to the next question. Okay, so we've got one more question here from Patrick. Is this something like what word to vec does for simple word embeddings? Yeah, in, in a sense, you could say that um, this is a, a similar kind of approach uh, to word to vec the, the main difference here is that um, in word to vec you're learning kind of universal representations. You know, one word has one unique um, uh, embedding. Whereas in this case, we're adapting the embeddings um, according to the training data. So the analogy for NLP is that instead of picking like um, dogs and owls, um, we would have uh, text. So we would have, for example, I love this pizza and I hate this pizza. So this is now a positive and negative example. And then we're going to push those text embeddings into different parts of the feature space that make it uh, easier to classify. So let's see. I think um, I'll take the other questions as we as we go a bit on. But um, this is the, the basic idea of contrastive learning. And the sort of kind of main question of how do you integrate contrastive learning um, in this uh, text uh, context is, you know, how do we generate these positive and negative uh, samples? So the way we do this uh, in the paper is suppose I give you um, a list of sentences or texts. So these might be, for example, movie reviews that you want to classify as positive or negative. And each one of these texts has some labels. Let's call them L1 to LN. And so what we need to do is we need to find a way of sampling from this uh, list of, of texts, which ones are positive and which ones are negative, so that then we can basically define this uh, distance function uh, between them. And the way we do this is we, we basically just randomly sample um, a sentence or a text, and we know it's label. And then what we do is we select another sample which has the same label. So the idea is that we're going to create first a positive pair um, of two sentences which have the same positive label. And then we play the same game where we basically pick now a new sample which has a different label uh, to the one we started with. And this will produce two kind of triples or tuples. So you're going to have one which is like your positive one with the positive label and one which is now a mix of a positive sentence and a negative sentence with a negative label. And this is now something that you can use in the standard contrastive uh, learning framework. And it has the effect of basically changing the, the sort of functionality of the transformer from being less about um, embedding sentences to now figuring out how you get good kind of representations of topics or you know, the domain of the classes that you're interested in. So let me... Lewis. Lewis, I'm sorry to interrupt, but could you uh, move? You're, you're still highlighting Patrick's question. It's, it's ah, kind of slight, sorry. so you might. Sorry, there we go. No worries. OK, so just to, just to sort of recap what I was saying, um, we, we basically sample from the, um, the small number of labeled sentences or text that we have, uh, positive examples and negative examples. And then we combine those to then do the contrastive learning uh, process. And this then produces something analogous to this example here where now in the feature space all of the texts that um, belong to a certain class will tend to get kind of clustered together versus those that are of different of a different class okay so let's see do we have any more questions okay so there's a question here from from yang which is um is this because the training objective between pre-training and fine-tuning is consistent, so the result will be better? So I think this was a follow-up question to this idea of like whether you should use a, a sentence transformer or a standard, um, uh, you know, bioencoder like BERT. And I don't know, maybe Moshi, would you like to share some insight on, like, you know, why do you think that the sentence transformer models tend to perform better as the backbone uh, for SetFit? Yeah, I think um, basically sentence transformers is also a pre-trained model that train on more than 1 billion pairs of sentences. So there is a good start of what is similarity between sentences and fine tuning basically add the topic information. So it's creating the topic embedding. So I think pre-training is kind of something analogy to the uh, cross encoder like BERT, which is uh, also pre-trained on, on, on MLM. So in this case, it, it was trained on, on similarity. Um, 
So I think it's, it's a good uh, pre-trained model to do the uh, topic similarity uh, versus uh, the uh, standard uh, cross-encoder. Great, thanks. That's a great answer. So we actually have another kind of related question about the contrastive learning process from Mark, which is, have you thought about using hard negative examples for fine tuning instead of random ones? So here the idea is that instead of looking that you specifically look for samples that are close to your positive sample in different class. So I don't know if you've ever ran this experiment, Moshi, but um, no. I think it, I think it would be uh, it it's would be an interesting one. It's a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We. Yeah. Yeah, the, the results that we'll show you today were just done with random sampling. So if someone wants to do the same experiments, but now with hard negative examples, um, I have a kind of intuition that maybe the performance would be slightly better. Mm -hmm. Great question, Mark. And there's another question here, which is I think a good one from Vishwas, which is if you have multiple classes, um, how is the selection of uh, negative classes done? So in, in our paper, we just used uh, random sampling. So the idea was that um, <clears throat> when I get my positive one, that's kind of clear. I just pick another example that has the same class. But then when I want to sample a negative one, I just pick um, one label that doesn't belong in the set that I'm looking at. And I suppose one could think of slightly more complicated things like stratified sampling, where you try to make sure that you're picking a similar amount of samples of, of the other classes. But at least in our sort of simple implementation, this, um, this seemed to work quite well. Um, and another question is maybe just worth mentioning here quickly is, um, does this work for multi-class multi-label? And uh, yeah, the answer is yes. We have a notebook in the repository, um, which we can quickly point you to after this, um, where we started with just multi-class, but um, this was extended to multi-label uh, by the community. So the results are, are also quite, quite compelling and I'll let, encourage you to check that out. Okay, so this was the sort of, in some sense, the, the real magic part of, of SetFit just comes down to this like contrastive learning step because after this, you've now got a, a sort of fine-tuned uh, sentence transformer. And then after that, it's just essentially doing standard test classification uh, and training uh, ahead. So let's maybe um, look at sort of some of the experiments that we did um, in the paper. So um, we compared uh, SetFit to a range of different uh, baselines. Um, the, the first one was the sort of obvious one, which is just fine tuning um, a Roberta Large model um, across all these different data sets. And we pick these data sets primarily for like diversity. So we look at things like uh, sentiment analysis, um, kind of counterfactual reasoning, um, like customer review, uh, classification, emotion detection, and then topic classification. And what you can see here is that when you've only got eight uh, labeled examples per class, uh, the performance of your sort of standard or vanilla transformer um, is, is usually quite low, um, except for some data sets like Enron Spam and AG News where, you know, but perhaps this is kind of already an easy data set to classify on. But in general, you can see that the average performance was around 43%. And then we compared other kind of, let's say, current state-of-the-art methods. So one is called Perfect, um, which is a, a special technique uh, adapts kind of like the, the work that was done at Adipet in a clever way. Um, and then there's the TFU model that I mentioned recently. Um, and in our paper, we only were able to run the 3 billion parameter model, um, but we've since then been able to run the 11 billion parameter one and the results are you know slightly better, but not significantly so. So what you can see here is that um, although uh, TFU um, performs um, really well, as we can sort of expect for an 11 or 3 billion parameter model. Um, on average, uh, SetFit does tend to be competitive in, when you've only got late label examples. So kind of an average, we're basically within one standard deviation um, of TPU. Um, and then as, this, uh, as you increase the sort of number of label examples that um, you have, then the, the kind of gap between TPU and uh, SetFit uh, shrinks. And so then you can see that uh, once we start doing this, the sort of average performance, you know, now instead of TFU being ahead, uh, we end up being slightly ahead. So these kind of results show that um, with like 
uh, eight or 64 labeled examples. Uh, for some data sets, you can get reasonably close to fine tuning on the full corpus. So for example, in SST5, um, you're around maybe 10 points behind an eight. And then once you have 64 examples, you get pretty close to the full fine tuning. And this is then um, you know, even clearer when we look at things like uh, AG news or Enron spam. Um, but the, you know, the kind of hardest ones at the moment are things like counterfactual reasoning um, where you can see that you know, there's still quite a gap to be closed. And this might be something that is just simply nature of the task is, is very difficult. Um, so in general, you know, set fit isn't a silver bullet. It won't you know, magically solve all of your business problems, but for, for many data sets, it, um, it does give uh, a, a big boost compared to standard fine training. And the other thing that we compared was um, sort of the, the training and inference times of set fit compared to TFU. And here you can see in this plot, this is uh, you know, roughly what it costs uh, to train uh, TFU on, um, uh, on a A100 um, versus training you know, set fit on the same data sets um, uh, on a sort of simple like T4 GPU that you get on, on, on Colab. Um, and so you can see here that, you know, although the performance between TFU and SetFit is not, you know, significantly different, it is roughly 30 times faster to train uh, SetFit. And in fact, this is, you know, just the 3 billion parameter model. So if we train the full 11 billion parameter model, then this number increases. And one of the things that's pretty interesting is um, you can actually even run SetFit on your laptop. Uh, it takes around uh, 10 minutes or so uh, to, to sort of train through uh, these eight labeled examples. And, you know, that's one of the things that we're very excited about is that you, you can sort of do few short learning really, you know, on your Mac and you don't need to use, you know, large 80 gigabyte A100 uh, GPUs for us. So let's see. Ah, oh, we have a good question from Chris, which is, did you experiment with different sizes of set fit? How small can the sentence transformer be and still be performant? That's a, a really good question. Um, we looked at uh, three sort of main models in the paper. One was um, the MPNet model, uh, which is the results I'm showing in this table. We also looked at um, a model called All Roberta Large, which is essentially a sentence transformer uh, trained with uh, a Roberta Large architecture. Um, and we also um, looked at uh, Mini LM sentence transformer, uh, which is uh, significantly smaller. Now, what we found is that um, MPNet is kind of your general best all-rounder. This is around a few hundred megabytes um, and uh, typically a few hundred million parameters. Um, and if you go down to the mini LM size um, where we're talking around 80 million parameters, the, the performance drops um, by a few percentage points. Um, but there's a technique that Oren will show us uh, soon on, on how you can reduce that gap using knowledge distillation. And there's a question here from Jonathan Sum. Did you say 10 minutes of training for future learning or 10 minutes for inference? That's for training. So to, to train a set fit model typically takes around 10 minutes on, on eight labeled examples in my um, laptop. Um, and um, the, the inference itself is, is as fast as a sentence transformer, basically. So you can optimize this using uh, you know, various techniques um, if you want. OK. And we actually have a question from Mathieu about multilingual transformers, and indeed, we, we looked at that. So this is another thing that um, is quite convenient about using a sentence transformer backbone um, in contrast to a, a large pre-trained language model. Um, because now, instead of having to come up with prompts for um, all of the you know, different tasks and the different um, uh, sort of labels that we want, what we can do is we can just switch the pre-trained model for a multilingual sentence transformer and then run the, the algorithm again. And so here we did experiments on something called the multilingual Amazon review corpus, where you've essentially got Amazon reviews in several different languages, and they're all rated with stars, you know, from one to five of sort of how good those reviews are. And so what you can see, um, these numbers, they correspond to the mean absolute error. So smaller is better. And if we just do standard fine tuning, um, most of our scores are roughly in the sort of 120 uh, uh, region. Um, and then using set fit, you know, roughly improves that by around 60%. Um, so we're not quite, you know, hitting the, the full fine tuning region uh, with eight labeled examples. Um, but of course, you could close that gap 
um, by by increasing and adding more labeled a few more labeled examples. So this is something that we were quite excited about because it allows you to um, quickly switch out to to different languages. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that um, uh, you know I think is like kind of an open question is like you know how do you handle very very low resource languages? Okay, so now I'm going to give the, the microphone over to Moshe. He's going to show us something that we didn't quite have a chance to cover in the paper, but it's also uh, quite a cool technique. So I'll let you uh, tell us a little bit about how we can actually use the same method to do zero shot classification. Yeah, so thank you, Luis. So, yeah, for zero shot, you actually don't have any training data. So instead of having uh, training data, what we uh, did is um, add the uh, basically uh, syntactic uh, sentences that describe the labels. For example, um, if it's a two uh, sentence um, specification, we had uh, this sentence is negative, label zero, and this sentence is positive, label, label one, that's it. And then we actually basically use the same um, set fit um, uh, trainer. And you can see the output of uh, the uh, pair generation you see that there is um, label one and label zero, and you see that um, label one is um, just uh, two uh, sentences, the same two sentences. Um, and actually it's, it's quite um, remind us the uh, work by uh, CMCSC, uh, presented by Gao in Yemen and P21, as he also did some unsupervised learning uh, with the sentence transformer, and actually uh, got very good results. Uh, so by just applying this trick, uh, we can actually get a zero shot uh, classification. And uh, surprisingly, it's um, actually outperform uh, uh, for the uh, standard part large NLI model that is used by transformers uh, pipeline. And we show uh, results in, in the next slide. And also you can uh, use this technique to augment uh, your few shot learning. So you can add the uh, uh, sentences as, as, as another, as an augmented data for the future of the experiment. And this is actually what we see here uh, the, the, uh, in the uh, upper um, uh, graph, we see the, uh, the uh, last line is uh, plus LE, which is uh, adding the, uh, the um, zero shot to the few shot. And you see a quite nice improvement uh, for some data set. And it's really worth trying Adding just the, uh, it's very easy to add the um, the labels and the and the data for this uh, specific uh, task. Also, you see the uh, the other uh, uh, table is actually comparison to the uh, part large MNLI, which is uh, 400 million parameters. We see quite nice improvement just using set fit uh, with the zero shot experiment with just 100 um, mil uh, million. Uh, as you see, a nice improvement here. Um, so it's actually worth trying just to add uh, and the uh, sentences as an augmented data. And I will show an example if we have time, how you can run uh, use this uh, to run the uh, experiment. Yeah, next slide for uh, it's about more describing the distillation. Uh, no one will the distillation part. Okay, I'll talk uh, briefly about the distillation. So uh, Lewis showed that SetFit is comparable with the state-of-the-art few shot methods. Uh, and in our main experiments, uh, we use the MPNet uh, sentence transformer as backbone. This is uh, the size of 110 million parameters. And in this section, a question was whether we can use uh, much smaller uh, sentence transformers uh, that can be even more useful and practical in deployments. And for this purpose, we tested the uh, set fit in a distillation setup. Uh, for the teacher, we used the uh, standard set fit with the MPNet backbone. Um, and for the student, we used Paraphrase Mini LM uh, as a sentence transformer backbone. And this uh, student contains only 15 uh, million parameters. Uh, which is seven times smaller than the, the teacher model. 
so the first step of the distillation setup was uh, just to train the teacher using 16 labeled samples per class. This is a standard set fit uh, training. And then the next step, you can see the block diagram on the right here, uh, was to train the sentence transformer of the student to mimic the uh, sentence transformer of the teacher by minimizing the loss between the student output and the teacher cosine similarity. And for that, we use pairs of, uh, uh, of sentences, uh, unlabeled uh, sentences. And the next step is uh, um, the standard step uh, of training the classification head of the, uh, of the student. But this time, we use the embeddings produced by the student and the logics produced by the teacher. So that's, that was our distillation setup. And you can see the results here. There are two uh, kinds of results. The first are shown in the two graphs above here. Uh, the x-axis is the number of unlabeled training data that we used. And the y-axis is the average accuracy. And the blue line is the set fit uh, student. And the orange line here is the uh, set fit, uh, is the uh, baseline uh, student, which is a standard transformer that we used. And what we can see here is that uh, when we use uh, a small number of unlabeled uh, training data, there's a significant uh, um, that uh, set fit outperforms significantly the, uh, the standard uh, transformer. But the gap decreases when you have more unlabeled data for training. So that was our first result. And then the table below shows a comparison between the set fit that is based on MPNet that we used in most of our experiments and the set fit student model, um, the bottom line here, the set fit mini LM. We see the speed, speed up gaps are, uh, uh, the set fit mini LM is six times faster. And the score here is the average score across all the data sets that uh, Louis showed. Uh, here in the distillation setup for the Set fit student, we used the, all of the available unlabeled data to, that we had. So there was an uh, unlabeled amount of uh, unlabeled data. Uh, and what we see here is that the set fit student closes the gap. We have only two uh, falls sh short in only two points from the set fit MPNet. Yeah, that's it. Great. Thanks a lot, um, Aaron. We have a question which is maybe more general um, about SetFit, which is, could you train end-to-end -end instead of on frozen embeddings? Um, so that's a, a really good question. Uh, I think the answer is yes. Um, we actually have a member of the community uh, implementing this uh, in, the, in the library. So maybe in, in a week or so, um, you'll be able to do this. But um, the, the sort of advantage of this approach of having frozen embeddings is that it makes it uh, you know a very simple thing to, to to implement. You just do this iteration of um, fine tuning the sentence transform with contrastive learning, and then you just do the standard classification head. Um, the advantage of using end to end uh, training is that we can then do more interesting things for like optimized inference. Um, so if we want to export the model into Onyx or something and then quantize it, then it's a little bit more convenient if it's just a single neural network end to end. But let's see um, you know how we go with that. Okay, so I thought what we could do now is we could segue into um, a little uh, example, some code, just to show you how this actually works uh, in practice. And if you go to Hugging Face uh, Set Fit on GitHub, um, we have a, a little library that uh, kind of implements uh, this. And um, what I want to show you is if you go down to the notebooks folder, um, we have a couple of notebooks uh, showing how you can do standard text classification to hyperparameter search um, to multi-label text classification. And I'll just start by just going through this uh, text classification uh, example. So here I'm just going to switch on the GPU so it runs a bit faster. Um, so we need to install setfit. This will take a few seconds. And um, one thing that we, we implemented is an integration directly into the Hugging Face Hub. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Hugging Face Hub, um, basically it's a hub for models, data sets, and machine learning demos. And inside the SetFit library, we have an integration where you can basically download sentence transformers from the hub, and then you can also push your fine-tuned uh, sentence transformer back to the hub. So you can then use it for, for other tasks. 
So um, what we're going to do when this uh, notebook is installed, we're going to just log in to our account. This will allow us to, to push the model to the hub. And the way you do that is on your profile, you can select. Uh, hey, Lewis, access. sorry to interrupt again, but would you mind uh, uh, highlight Ethan's, Ethan's comment? Thanks. Thanks. Sorry about that. All right. So in order to push our model to the hub, we're going to need um, uh, a token. So you can generate that from your profile by going to the settings. And when you feed this token into this widget, this will now essentially log us in uh, to our account on Colab. So that's just a little detail that we need to uh, set up when we're running uh, from Colab. And we also need to do a little bit of Git stuff here. So I'm just going to put my email address. Oops. And my name. So please don't send me tons of spam mail. Okay, so what we'll do today is we'll um, do just a simple binary classification on the SST2 data set. And we're going to use um, the MPNet model that we used in our paper. This we found was a good all-rounder. So the way we can get this data set is using the load data set function from the data sets library. This will basically pull from the Hugging Face Hub the SST2 data set. And you can see here in this example, um, we've got things like um, a bunch of sort of sentences and then they're kind of labeled, you know, positive or negative. And this is um, some sort of fairly, you know, popular academic benchmark um, extracted from movie reviews. So the idea is, you know, how well can we classify these uh, sentences using just a small number of examples? So. The first thing we're going to do is just create a kind of simulated few shot data set. So, you know, in this case, the, the training set has 67,000 uh, labeled examples. And the idea we want to do is just see, okay, if I just select eight examples that are positive and negative, um, how well can we do? So I'm just going to do that using, um, you know, a little bit of shuffling and uh, slicing from data sets. So now we've got a, a training data set, which has 16 examples, eight for positive and eight for negative. Um, and we'll use now the, like the full validation set um, uh, to sort of measure how well our model is doing. I think in reality, you know, you wouldn't have like the full validation set, which has 872 examples. In reality, you know, in, in the real world, you've only got a certain number of labeled examples. And so there you might have to think about things like, you know, how do you define your um, evaluation in a way that is not too noisy? Um, and there's actually a question here. Does it matter that your classes are not balanced? Yeah, so um, I think in this case, I'm just trying to simulate a, a small example of, of few shot uh, um, a data set. Um, in practice, probably there is a little bit of a uh, question of like, should you stratify your sampling? And in the, in the paper, um, the sampling we used was a little bit more sophisticated. Um, I would say that in those cases where you have imbalance, um, probably the best thing to do is to just make sure you're not using accuracy as your metric. Uh, pick a metric like F1, which is a little bit less insensitive to the imbalance. Um, but yeah, you can do a slightly more sophisticated sampling if needed. Okay, so we've got a data set now um, and it's gonna be pretty simple to train the model. We basically, uh, we use a from pre-trained method. So if you're used to using transformers, it's the basically the same API. Um, we just specify a model ID on the hub, which in this case is a sentence transformer. So we go to sentence um, transformers, and then it's probably paraphrase mpnet. Okay, or well, it's one of these, very similar like this. And you can see that, you know, this is a, a model on the hub, which has got some sort of model card and how to use it. And we're just gonna download the weights um, into our notebook and then initialize this uh, with both the uh, sentence transformer body and the classification head. And the first time you do this, you'll get some kind of warning that the model head was not found in the hub um, and that we're gonna initialize it with uh, random weights. So, you know, you should train this model on a downstream task. And that's because at the very start, when we create the set fit model, we're just taking the pre-trained sentence transformer and the, the, the head and neither, neither of these have been uh, trained for set fit. So what we need to do is do first the contrastive learning and this um, 
uh, classification head. So the way we can do that uh, kind of quickly is using a, a trainer. So we have a, a set fit trainer class where you provide a model, you provide the data sets you want to train and evaluate on. Um, and then you can specify the type of loss that you want to use for contrastive learning. So one of the things that we investigated in, in our analysis was like what effect, um, you know, does the type of loss have on the final performance? Because in contrastive learning, there are like different losses that have been proposed over the years for how you measure essentially distance uh, between your, your positive and negative samples. And we found that the cosine similarity works quite well. Um, there are more sophisticated things like triplet loss or subcon loss. Um, but in, in general, um, you know, we found that there's not a huge difference uh, between using uh, them versus the simple one of cosine. And then the other thing is the number of epochs. So this is essentially the number of uh, epochs we're going to use for contrastive learning. Um, that's a, a parameter that we found just generally one epoch does quite well. And then the number of iterations here um, indicates how many times we're going to sort of do the sampling process to create our kind of, um, you know, augmented data set. Because if you think about what we're doing um, in SetFit, so if we go back here, um, do, do, do. when we do this uh, sentence generation, we're sampling a number of times from the list of available uh, texts that we have. And that, those number of iterations is kind of a, a hyperparameter that we can tune. Um, we found that generally, you, you know, doing this uh, generation 20 times gives uh, pretty good results. Um, but you can also use the hyperparameter search functionality uh, to find um, the, the best one. So the last one is that um, uh, in, uh, in sentence transformers or the way we've implemented this, we kind of expect that your um, text and label columns are normalized with uh, a common name. So generally we expect your text to lie in a text column, your labels yeah. to lie in a label column. And if they don't, in the case, for example, if we look at an example of, um, da, da, da. so in the case of SST2, all of the texts are living in a sentence uh, column, then this column mapping here can be used to sort of align uh, those, uh, essentially relabel your columns uh, so that it um, you know, will work out of the box. So now we've got a trainer. Uh, we can train it. And um, this is, uh, i uh, going to, you know, probably take uh, maybe uh, 30 seconds or something. Let's see how we go. Um, so this is essentially using um, these like 640 examples now with these that we've augmented through this uh, sentence generation step. And that's now trained the model. And we can then evaluate it and uh, see how well our accuracy is. So let's see. Okay, so we got around 67% accuracy. Um, using just eight labeled examples per class. Now, in general, this isn't going to be as good as uh, training, you know, the, a full model um, on um, on the sixty-seven thousand examples. So, for example, I think if we look here, um, do we have performance somewhere? This model. So, yeah, if you if you train, for example, distill BERT, you're going to get something like ninety-one percent. Um, however, that, just to give you, you know, this is a huge orders of magnitude difference in labeled data. So if you have, you know, more than eight labeled examples, you can then bridge that gap uh, by simply applying set fit um, on this way. And then the last thing to show is um, you can push the model to the hub. So, um, you know, you can say set fit uh, fine tuned on SST2. And if we push this to the hub, it will now create a repository on the hub um, under your account, and then you can uh, use that for inference, um, you know, in your own applications. So Colab takes a, a very long time um, to, to actually uh, push things. Um, but it, while that's happening, we've got a kind of organizational interesting question from Chris. So maybe I'll just put that here for Moshi. So how did the Hugging Face and Intel collaboration come to be? Uh, you mentioned that Moshi first had the idea of it. So yeah, maybe Moshi, you'd like to talk about that. Oh, yeah, well, with Hagen Face, we have a long history. Started something like four or five years ago when we had the NLP Architect Library. And then we have some research collaboration with Hagen Face, started a few years ago. And um, yeah, with SetFit, it's, it's, it's 
quite uh, was quite nature intuitive to to continue and and work together to uh, validate that fit uh, for many uh, data sets. So we just uh, since we are already had some established some collaboration, we continue to collaborate on that fit. It was quite nature. Um, And uh, maybe an interesting question is, how did you get the idea of SetFit? I think what, from, what, what inspired you for that? I think from uh, yeah, from from the image uh, domain, they have a similar approach that they use uh, contrastive learning to do. Uh, I think the original paper from Koch, uh, something like in 2015, he had a similar approach for a one-shot classification. So I think that, and when you know it was. And I actually was familiar with the SBERT Sensor Transformer Library, which was actually quite amazing uh, to do the, uh, in just two, three lines of code, you're doing a full fine tuning of Sensor Transformer. So, you know, one plus one was actually, yeah, it was quite obvious that you can actually, and I think something like uh, 20 minutes, I actually run the first set fit on, on SSD too. So it's, uh, it's quite uh, easy uh, when you have SBERT, it's, it's very easy uh, to implement uh, sentence transformer and fine tuning because it was, it was uh, obvious. Yeah. Great, thanks. So we have a question here from Larea, which is, does SetFit work with all transform models? So I'm not sure about all, but um, generally speaking, if you have something like an encoder um, base model, then uh, set fit will be compatible with it. Um, but to be more specific, um, essentially, if you go to the Hugging Face Hub and you pick um, under the Models tab, you can select for different libraries. So here you've got transformers and things like this. If you click on Sentence Transformers, you will get you know 771 different models, uh, ranging of different sizes, different uh, pre-training data sets. And generally speaking, um, a large number of these models will be suitable uh, for, for a set fit. So, for example, you know, the Mini LM one is the one that um, Aaron was talking about. So it's very small and compact. Um, you can also use the multilingual ones and so on. So, my suggestion would be to, to check out the sentence transformers list of models and then just, you know, try different ones there. Um, Niels Reimer, who was part of this collaboration as well. He's also the creator of uh, Sentence Transformers, and he actually has a really nice um, table on his documentation where he shows like all the different pre-trained models and how they kind of uh, perform from an embedding perspective. So you can see here, like you know, which model gets the best score uh, on sentence embeddings, and what's the average performance, what's the speed, and you can kind of filter this for like a, whole, a very large range of like models that he's curated. And so personally, what I do is I actually look first on, on Niels's documentation to see, you know, what's a good model that seems to get good performance and is not too large. And then um, using that, uh, you, you got a good start. Um, okay. And so we have maybe time for a few more questions. So... Here's one which I think is something we didn't solve, which is uh, how to overcome the sub-token limit of the base models to classify longer documents. So I don't know if, uh, if you ever did experiments in this case, Moshi, but my understanding is that, um, you know, because we're essentially doing sentence transformers, then we, we sort of truncate the long documents uh, to, you know, whatever the, the context size is. Um, Okay, so let's just have a quick look at if this model has finished. Okay, so as you can see, Colab is extraordinarily slow. Six minutes to push three, 400 meg. It's, um, <laughs> it's going to take us a while. Um, so while that goes, I'll answer a few more questions. Um, here's a question I don't know the answer to. Can we compare SetFit to other episodic-based models like MatchingNet or ProtoNet? Do you have any ideas, Moshe or Aaron? Uh, no. 
Maybe yeah, so verification. Yeah, I, I know that um in a lot of these like parameter efficient approaches, um, people use things like these prototypical networks to try and get better performance, but um I'm not totally familiar. So if you want, yeah. Yang, you can clarify a bit. Um another question we have is um from Alexander. Did you experiment with longer multi-sentence text as well? Um yeah, so we, we, we did. Um if we look at um the sort of summary results here. Um, here we've got, for example, Enron spam is a, a sort of spam classification data set and it's got very long emails. So here we truncated things to um, 256 tokens, um, so a few paragraphs. Um, but you can see that, you know, the difference, it's set fit still does uh, quite well um, and is still better than our standard fine tuning. Um, with things like Enron Spam, also AG News has uh, relatively long uh, text, except it does quite well. Um, so yeah, in general, the, the length of the, the text uh, doesn't play a huge role, unless of course you're dealing with very long text classification tasks and there, you know, set fit might need to be kind of combined with other techniques like, you know, sliding windows over the document to chunk it into smaller pieces for classification. Okay. Um, and great, the model's gone to the hub. And so if we now check it out, we've got a, a set fit model here under my account. And this now means that if you want to use it for inference, we can just uh, use the from pre-train method again um, from um, uh, set fit. And then this will essentially load the model in a very similar way to the Transformers pipeline. So you just provide um, a, a list of texts and then this will uh, generate the predictions. And so soon when this uh, downloads, we'll then see what comes out. And let's see, any last questions? There's an interesting question here from Vimal, which is, could one use these kind of techniques with like clip embeddings? So that's kind of an interesting question in a sense of like whether you can combine text encoders with, uh, you know, ResNets to, to get like maybe better kind of search, semantic search, but I'm not sure about image classification. Have you thought about that combination, Marcia, or Interesting. So yeah, I don't think we've uh, thought about that, but that's definitely an interesting thing to, to look at. And then um, just to see how we go. Okay, so the model has now predicted one and zero for these input texts. And okay, in this case, perhaps they're a little easy, but it's pretty clear that, you know, you shouldn't add pineapple to your pizza and the model got that right. So um, well done, Sophie. Um, Okay, so I think maybe we can, uh, our sort of time is up, but um, if there's any sort of like last uh, burning questions, we can take them in the chat. I think we have uh, an interesting one here from, from Dennis, which is how would this work for token classification? Um, so yeah, this is indeed work in progress. We, we don't know the, the exact answer. Um, and the, the kind of challenge here is that with, um, in, in the text classification case, right, we were talking about um, kind of clustering the embeddings according to their classes in, in the feature space. And this is like instance-based classification where you take the full example and then it's just a single embedding. In the token classification case, it's uh, trickier because now instead of just having like a single embedding for the, for the input, we now have multiple embeddings, right? One for every token. And there is work, uh, previous work on, on trying to figure out how you do like few shot uh, token classification, um, again, using different types of transformers. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're still trying to figure out if we can uh, do this uh, kind of more efficiently uh, than what is currently done. Okay. And maybe the last question from Chris is what's wrong with pineapple and pizza? Um, <laughs> I, I think um, the answer is, of course, everything. Everything is wrong with pineapple pizza. 
Yeah, so maybe with that, um, are there any final words, Moshe or Oren or Luke, you would like to share? Hopefully the community will continue to explore set fit for other tasks. I think it's uh, also quite interesting to see how we can uh, use unlabeled data to improve performance, even for the text classification use cases, and also apply it to other um, tasks like uh, two-sentence classification and also trying to think, think about not just topic, maybe full document classification and more than that. So there are really many opportunities. I hope to, uh, to see more results uh, from the community. Yeah, great, great point. And um, if you want to contribute, for example, new applications, you're more than welcome to open an issue or a pull request on the SetFit library and um, myself or someone else in the team will, um, will respond. So, Aaron, any last words? Uh, no, thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks for the great collaboration. Hope the community will continue to contribute into it. It's very exciting to see yeah. shot working in the real world. Yeah, and if, if people world. find nice use cases or, or where SetFit worked well, and you know, especially around deployment, uh, please feel free to share them with us. We'd be very excited to hear um, both where it works and where it doesn't, so we can you know make it better. So with that, I'll uh, end the broadcast. Thank you, everyone, for, for chiming in. Uh, we hope uh, you learned something new. And uh, yeah, till the next uh, event. I'll catch you later. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.